Hello to everyone from a rather cold and windy London. I hope the weather is better where you are. Um, we are here today for a talk on Islamic art as an experience. And first and foremost, I wanted to thank the UAE Minister of Culture and Knowledge Development and the Al Burde Endowment for organizing this and bringing us together in what I hope will be an interesting discussion. Um, Nasser Asalem was unfortunately unable to be with us, but we are joined, joined here by Fatima Uzdeneva and Amara Al-Attar. And um, we want to talk about what creates their process and what inspires them uh, and for them to tell us more about their work. Now, the al was founded by the Ministry of Culture and Knowledge Development to empower creativity in Islamic art and to recognize distinguished artists across the Islamic world. Um, first, there was uh, the al -Burda Award that was launched in 2004, which sought to cultivate Islamic culture and artistic development by supporting traditional Islamic arts and Arabic. Now there is the Endowment, which is an initiative to expand the reach of Islamic culture by recognizing creative powers who embrace experimentation and reinterpretation in their approach to Islamic art and culture. And I think today our discussion is going to be very much about this reinterpretation, uh, disruption and creativity, innovation. So the artists produced by the endowment uh, generally produce works that are inspired by the aesthetics of Islamic art and culture, but they use a range of exciting media such as sculpture, textile based work, photography, installation, virtual reality, and experiential projects. So we won't waste any time. We want to speak directly to the artists. And um, I think I'm going to initially speak to Amar and ask Amar a little bit about his process, his artistic practice. Amar, how do you come to what you do? Tell us a little bit about your practice in general. Uh, okay, first, uh, thank you for the Ministry of Culture and Knowledge Development for hosting this talk, and thanks for everyone who's joining us. Uh, I started, like, uh, get interested first in the medium of photography and uh, to, to document whatever uh, rituals and uh, cultural, and also the, uh, the scene around me, which uh, got me interested in to research more about uh, the, the things happening around me in, my, in UAE and uh, try to discover and ask people about it. And uh, this is kind of, uh, for me, opened eye to things that uh, we usually don't see in everyday uh, life that we're living. Uh, so from there, I also like uh, started, uh, if you can, uh, I don't know if anybody can see my website. Uh, in 2011, I started a project called Visual Diaries which I went around and documented uh, different scenes of UAE. And from there, I like, uh, got more interested into going more deep on each photo that I photographed. For example, I photographed uh, uh, like the prayer rooms. I photographed the water, uh, Sabir water, which is they put it outside the mosque, which people can come and drink. And for me, it was more of a, uh, a practice and, and seeing also uh, something that I want to document and keep for future generation. Uh, and from there, I started also to research more because in uh, an artist's practice, it's more of a research for me, uh, myself, and the process of uh, getting to know more uh, people about, about each subject. Uh, like, yeah. Well, thank you. No, uh, that, that's a wonderful introduction to what you do because in fact, I wanted to say also that your bio says you're a self-taught photographer, mixed media artist, and you're passionate about documentation, which is exactly what you're telling us about research and study to do with Emirati geography and culture, the environment around you. And you're based in the beautiful Emirate of Ajman uh, and you, your work centers on everyday life and you created a growing visual anthropology of the UAE. So this is a very important um, exercise in its own way. So aside from the artistic and creative process, you're also documenting and offering a kind of historical perspective in a way. So um, you have also said, I don't focus on what is conflict based, but rather our shared rituals and beliefs, activities, and I try to celebrate this, which is something I think it's a message that's important to convey about your work. So thank you for that. I'm going to turn, and I will 
come back to you, if I may, uh, Amar, to ask more specifically about the work that's being shown in the endowment exhibition. Sure. And I should stress to anybody who is on this call um, that there is a 360 degree virtual tour of the exhibition that's been launched on the Alborda website. And I really encourage people to check that out and take a look at the work themselves. So I'm going to turn to Fatima and ask Fatima a little bit about her inspiration and her concept uh, of what she does. Now, I should say briefly that um, Fatima is both based in the UK, the UAE and the North Caucasus. She's a graduate of the Royal College of Art, uh, which she left in 2019. She completed the Sheikha Salama bin Hamdan uh, Emerging Artist Fellowship in Abu Dhabi. Her practice is anchored in the concept of garden as a place of conquest, and it's strong in uh, sort of addressing a spiritual terrain as source of action. So please tell us, Fatima, a bit about what you do in general. Um, I would say my practice is also research-based, um, and garden takes a very important place within my practice. and. This interest came about probably when I was doing my um, fellowship with Sheikha Salama Foundation. And it's, you know, it stayed with me and it always kind of creeps into my work. Uh, these themes of garden, whether it's garden as a space of nourishment. So, um, for example, I wrote my dissertation on colonial botany and how mm -hmm. botany propelled colonial expansion or um, Garden is a, sp a spirituality, so Janna, Paradise, which is a, yes. I believe, ancient Persian word uh, for a world garden. Um, so it's a space that I keep coming back to, and Barzakh in particular, um, which was the focus of my work for, with Alberta Endowment, is, uh, is another concept that I keep coming back to maybe for five or six years now, and I'm so thrilled that I was able to actually um, Take this project to fruition with the endowment we received. And but surely quite a sort of a different, a very opposing concept because garden is clearly very reposing and calm and serene, whereas Barzakh we think of as a space which is quite, uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, challenging. Well, it's a it's a unknown space. We don't, uh, Barzakh can be a beautiful space or kind of a nightmare. It right. really. It really depends on um, on person's thoughts and actions and deeds and so on. But I was also trying to look at, take the concept a bit further from eschatology and from maybe just um, Barzak dealing with death and afterlife and mm -hmm. trying to apply it to contemporary life. So looking at Barzakh, you know, a human being is a Barzakh because we're between, you know, the kind of embodying some uh, divine qualities, but also very base qualities, you know, about- Could I ask the, you to define, could I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but could I ask you to define Barzakh for the viewers who don't know what that concept is? It's obviously very clear to Muslims what Barzakh is, but tell us what that is for you. In Islamic eschatology, Barzakh is a space after death and before resurrection. So I guess, the closest thing, if we draw a parallel with uh, maybe Christianity, it would be a kind of a purgatory, but it's yes. not really the same. It's more of a waiting place. So, you know, it's um, like a bus terminal or yeah. duty-free, if you will, if, if I want to draw contemporary parallels. So it's a place of waiting, mm -hmm. uh, being in between. It's a barrier between this world and the other world. Right. Well, to come back to Amar, Amar, I'm very curious to know how, what is the starting point for your work? For example, the work that you have in this endowment exhibition, this particular world, uh, work on the Maulid, it's uh, called Maulid Virtual Reality, and it's a 360 degree video montage celebrating the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I wonder, how did you get to that point? What brought you to look at that as a subject for an artistic expression? Yeah, uh, I've been hearing about uh, some activities that called Maulid from my childhood. And I knew that my father, my, my father's uncle, he used to go there uh, every like Maulid in Nabawi, which is in uh, uh, the Arabic, uh, uh, 
so it, so I I tried to you know ask th about about it and try to find people who actually do it because in certain time of the, of the uh, from the last 20 years it wasn't that popular and a lot of people uh, said in Islam that it's something that we should not do and because uh, Pro uh, Prophet Muhammad he didn't celebrate it. so anyway not, not uh, going to that uh, side but I just wanted to to see it I just want to experience it I wanted to go and as a documentary I want to document it uh, because uh, maybe a certain day in future it will be it look different maybe it will it will have a different feeling also yes so I, I you know I, I saw also in the in his diaries as my my father's uncle diaries that he went to that uh, mosque so I asked the people and I you know these days on the internet you can find people easily in certain uh, subjects so I asked uh, some researcher who who do actually research about uh, al Marid in UAE. And he did a, a, a big research about it and uh, created a book. So I went to him and I asked him several times, like, uh, I want to attend and this. I want to see what you're doing and I want to document it. So he gave me this access, you know, and uh, one of the important things for like someone like me to get access to these things yes. so I can document exactly. it. And uh, especially he told me that you have to document the people who do Malad and uh, there is an um, old majlis in Abu Dhabi that will be uh, demolished because the owner of that majlis, he passed away three years ago. And uh, the, the people who run it now, they're his sons and this. And uh, they do Malad, but, but they do it first uh, privately. They don't allow other people from other places to come. But at the same time, they want to renovate that place. But the porta cabin that they do on it, it's very old and it's from the 70s maybe. And you have to document that. So from there, you know, I, get more, I, I went there and I documented it to get to know the people there. So, so that's my you know, way of how to get us, uh, the project. I try to always to, to ask people more, of whoever in, the, in that, uh, that subject, whoever related to that subject. And... Uh, the idea of doing it in a VR, because uh, usually I do analog photography. I shoot film and I shoot, you know. So that's what, that was like a completely opposite for my practice, like uh, doing it in a virtual reality. But uh, I, whenever I attended that, uh, the Malid, I wanted actually people to, to experience it because uh, maybe they will not see it or maybe uh, uh, they, they cannot attend it or they are in a different place. So even if they took that work, uh, that VR device and took it anywhere in the world, they can still experience it. Even if, you are, if it's on the internet, people now in, at home, they have their own devices uh, and they can, they can view it online. So, so that you know, made me you know, uh, want to do the VR experience. Uh, because you know, I wanted to experience. I want to challenge myself to experience the new, or to, to try the new uh, the technologies and how to use it in art. And uh, this is, you know, these things are VR and augmented reality, and these are the new technologies that I think, especially in these days after the coronavirus, that it will more and more uh, you know, uh, art that will be done in this way. Exactly, it will be a great tool at the service of art and artists in order to be able to sort of use it when physical yeah. presence can't be achieved. Now, yes. uh, it's fascinating for me uh, to hear about how innovative your approach has been to something that is in a way very traditional. And you know, when we use the term Islamic art, it immediately, for most people, conjures up the idea of traditional arts, embellishment, geometry, ornamentation, you know, and right now I'm speaking to two art artists who have really sort of pushed the boat out and pushed the boundaries in terms of experimentation. And this is a really important um, aspect of what is happening in the context of contemporary art that is informed and inspired by Islamic art. And in this respect, I feel very strongly about the extraordinary uh, platform that Alberta has offered to artists in order to be able to express this and in a sense create a new visual canon from my perspective anyway as an outsider. So tell me Fatima, tell us a bit about the, your particular work, work in this show, you know, what does transience uh, symbolize for you? And I know you've mentioned about, you know, hotel lobbies, airport terminals, 
talk more about this space of transition and limbo? Um, maybe I'll describe the work a little bit in case um, people who are joining us haven't seen it. So it's, um, it's a space that you can enter that holds several works. Um, there is a text you can pick up and read and take, take with you. Um, you, can, you could stay in the place and you can't anymore, which is something I would like to talk about as well, maybe a bit later. Um, uh, there are also sculptures uh, that you can interact with and the viewer participation is something very important to my practice. But I'm also very curious about um, maybe therapeutic qualities of art and how um, psyche and uh, body maybe they interact and they maybe figure things out. So it holds maybe 12 works if we're going to count them. Um, the each, each one has a name and um, Naming my work is very important to me because a big part of my practice is writing. For example, uh, there is a work called Life, Death, Eternity, you and I, which is an abstract from a painting, uh, which you can also, you could rearrange. And it had a little kind of a map cheat sheet on the wall, which, which gave you a um, way to understand the color codes. So you could kind of meditate and spend time in the space. So. It's really, really um, an invitation to come in and stay and reflect or meditate, if that's the word you want to use, or have a discussion. And um, when we had the exhibition at Manarat Sadiat, um, there was in fact a lot, in fact, a lot of uh, conversation, and which was something very important and interesting for me, especially because most of the conversation happened with really young people. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you wouldn't expect uh, them maybe to be interested in such heavy, as a lot of people would say, maybe a subject. Um, so yeah, I, that's that's the that's what it do is. Do you yeah. do you also feel, uh, Fatima, that your sort of ex your approach to experiential um, uh, and the sort of installation aspect of addressing your work, do you feel also that this is, that makes it more suitable for the future uh, of possibly more and more online artistic expressions rather than the physical? Or do you feel that the physical experience of your work is paramount to the, the right understanding of it? It's a really uh, big question, I think, for me at the moment, and I don't think I have an answer. Um, until now, physical en engagement has been very, very important. Um, we also live in a time where things move very fast and we're very busy and there isn't a lot of time to stop and um, maybe uh, engage with things in a tactile manner. And also, you know, if we're talking about contemporary art, you don't go into a gallery and touch artwork or, in, or into museums. So part of it was also challenging this notion of you know, very precious things that you can touch, you can only look. Um, but going forward, you know, given the situation we're in, I, I don't know, I was thinking maybe, you know, I'm the kind of the work that I do that's, it is typed out, maybe I need to send it to someone's house to interact with because you can never get the same feeling by looking at something that you're meant to interact with. Um, yes. I so that's a, yeah, that's a big challenge for me to, not just for me, for a lot of artists who have that kind of work to figure out. Now, I actually, I think Amar is able to allow us some access to visuals. Amar, are you able to show yes. a few works, um, both yours and Fatima's, because it will be nice for the audience to be able to see this. And for me, actually, again, what I find fascinating is that, um, as artists, you both ventured into really experimental ground, so to speak. And that's so important because I know, for example, with, in the case of Iran, a lot of artists are having to produce mainly commercial works that, that can be bought for market purposes. And there may not be enough sometimes the possibility to create experimental work because that needs a public pla platform in a sense. It needs to have a platform where it can be shown without the concern for the market. Do you feel, and I'd like to address this 
to Amar, do you feel that the freedom um, that, the, for example, Alberta Environment has given you to be able to produce a work that you can, that you can create without concerns for the market, that this is important to you? Yeah, it's always, uh, it's a great platform to show work and to experience, uh, I mean, experiment work uh, in places that is not other than a gallery. Because yes. usually a gallery, it gives you this limitation of something that they can sell. Yes. You know, not something that, uh, although I see as an artist, you know, you need to be smart here. You need to know where you are showing. And yeah. at, the same, at the same time, uh, sometimes as I, I create artwork that I know I never know where it will show it will be shown, so mm -hmm. so so always you know as an artist you know you 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 see first where you will show the work and then you will you will you know you will you will envision that your your end result how you want people yes. uh, interact with your artwork exactly so there's a delicate balance between creating a work that that's entirely from your own inspiration and also the location it might go to, the audience it might speak to. But tell me, do you feel that the Alborda possibility that the endowment has, has given you a facility and a freedom to do something that you may not otherwise do? Yes, of course, like Alborda, they give us, first of all, the time that uh, we think and uh, uh, it was almost like six months or more than that. That to to think and to go and to, and they and and they didn't, they didn't specify for us like what you have to do you know they yes. just create so something. So you had the freedom. That, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, we had the freedom and uh, and that was you know helping us to be more creative in how we want to install and how we want to show our work. Yeah, yeah. that that's obviously clearly very important. And also, I know that reading about your work, I'm not you have expressed that it's important for you to introduce certain aspects of you know, your geography, your environment, uh, certain little known aspects uh, of perhaps the Islamic culture that you are platforming. And I think I, my question would be, do you feel it's important to bring this to an international attention? Because so often we are used in our region to importing Western culture, and that's all well and good, and we've reinterpreted things, and we've used it, and given it our own flavor and our own interpretations. But at the same time, I think it will be probably quite welcome, and please correct me if I'm wrong, to perhaps take our inspirations and influences and our legacies and introduce it to a different audience. Do you have that in the back of your mind? Yeah, it's always, you know, uh, when, when, whenever I started my prayer room series, I always wanted this uh, series and this work uh, show our local culture or our regional culture to the to the international world. So yes. because you know it's not just uh, we we don't just import art or we there are a lot of uh, artists and art work or people who are based here do art work in in this region. That is that that is a world class level, you know, and and they can show it and they can export themselves to that. Uh, part of the world, to the west or to the east or wherever. And I'm glad that a lot of my work, I uh, was very lucky that to show it in, in uh, US, in uh, Europe, in China. And it was also like a part of that, uh, you know, uh, different museums, which, uh, which for me, it's like uh, something that uh, I always uh, like think about whenever I, I see, I show my work, especially uh, the thing that I photograph or whatever I, the work I do, it's very private, but at the same time, uh, it gives access to people who are, uh, you know, cannot access these places. Like, exactly. you know, the prayer room, like the, you know, the, the, the mallet, as we see in this work. Yes. And also, uh, I have a story that uh, one of, uh, in 2013, I participated in Sharjah Binali, and uh, it was uh, curated uh, by a Japanese curator. Uh, so, so, so uh, TV from Japan, NHK, very known TV, and mm -hmm. they came to Sharjah and they doc they photographed me. Uh, I mean, they interviewed me, and uh, you know, the, the the director of that program he told me, "You give me some uh, uh, information about your uh, religion and culture that I never thought about, and I, you, you change my mind." You know? So that's what's you know exactly. maybe one exactly. of the role of uh, 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 as artists to do. You know? Exactly. But at I mean, the same often, time, 
yeah. yeah. But at the same time, not only the Islamic part, also we have other parts in the region, the culture uh, that uh, that developed with the development of the country also. Like I did a project about the cinema also, cinema in UAE and, uh, well, you know, other, yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, there's always a very fine uh, marriage, if you like, between indigenous culture, between folk practices, between tribal practices, what is in the environment, as you say, uh, what we call the term we call culture, our beliefs and practices, and the religious aspect of things in our region. And this interaction between folk and, um, you know, environmental and the religion comes up with some very interesting, very fascinating expressions. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is to capture um, really special angles of it and introducing it to a world, to the outside world, which may not normally be able to access all of this. And it's a hugely important exercise because some aspects in the same way that, for example, I, I'm a Muslim and when I may uh, attend mass, a Catholic mass, you know, the first time I attended it, I found it extraordinarily moving. Of course, I'd, I'd never, you know, I, I'm not a Christian. I hadn't any connection to it. But the fact remains that in your particular work, for example, the Mawlid, there's something very moving, very experiential involved. And um, this is an important thing to communicate because it, it's not very well known. To, to go to Fatima, you know, Fatima, I think what I, I find in, in your work is that it's also very sort of your concepts, uh, very strong concepts of how you see um, particular aspects of Islam. And I would love to hear more about in your personal history and how you kind of um, interrelate with these factors, your own culture being obviously from the North Caucasus. How do you relate, again, to the Islamic culture in those terms? Uh, before I answer your question, I just wanted to add something to what you, know, you and Amr were saying. Um, until I experienced Amr's work, I have never seen or heard of Maulud, for example. Yeah. Where I come from, Maulud is um, a memorial service when someone passes away. Mm -hmm. So when I heard it, I, I was completely confused. I wasn't sure what it meant and where do I see it? And also, for example, in North Caucasus, it's not something that would really be welcomed because as Amar was saying, it was, it's something that some people find contentious and it shouldn't exist. It's kind of innovation. So for me, it was mind blowing to experience it because I've, I've lived here from 1995, but I never knew about it. So it's really amazing to uh, to be able to still learn new things, even in the place you've been to, you know, for a quarter of exactly. a century. Exactly. Wonderful. Uh, going back to your question, um, this work in particular came from a personal experience, which is, um, as a, most human experiences, is not really unique. It's something that everyone experiences or will experience. It came from uh, experiencing uh, death and grief and kind of wondering and asking those big questions, you know, what happens, what's after? And, you know, not really finding satisfying answers um, and just going kind of deep into this well of questioning. And um, luckily I was swayed into kind of a spiritual side of myself and that's where I found answers. And then um, from the kind of the emotions also, this uh, interest in um, this concept, almost like a philosophical concept was born and I was really, I was really interested to explore it further. And I have to say, um, Fatima, I was fascinated to, to sort of see in, in the material I read about you that you related so much to life today, you know, as I say, waiting spaces, lobbies, a doctor's waiting room, um, and, and the chaos of capitalism, you know, um, it's, it's wonderful to be able to sort of see the parallels, to understand the connections, and to relate uh, your expressiveness and your kind of um, observations and insights and relate it to what does it mean to our life today? And, and that I think is, is, is a very important aspect because artists are known obviously to hold up mirrors to their environment, to their society, to life, to everyday life. And I think both of you have done this in, in the most enlightening way. 
But I would then, it, this, then it brings me to this question, would you still call your art Islamic art? Or, I mean, this is, I know this is a discussion that has been had before, but I'm very curious to know because you both create very contemporary avant-garde work. You know, we don't associate installations or, you know, VR with Islamic art, but today's talk really is about Islamic art as an experience. Would you call your work within, you know, if there were a visual canon with a name on it, would you call it Islamic art or would you call it something else? Um, I don't think it hurts to call it that because as you were saying, uh, Islamic art has been for such a long time uh, associated with ornamentation, sacred geometry and so on. Um, and I feel like maybe putting works like mine and Amor's and the rest of the endowment recipients in this context will, um, will kind of reinvigorate what this term means. Um, exactly. I yeah. feel like the current climate is, you know, in the world. Uh, it's not a bad thing at all. And I, I personally don't have a problem with it. I mean, of course, our practices are not strictly just that, but there are works that fall within that realm. How, how do you feel, Amr? How, how, what, what is your view on this? Yeah, like uh, Islamic art, I mean, I did a lot, lots of, uh, like, lots of uh, some, some projects that is related to the religion, which is Salah uh, and the prayer rooms and the civil water also, which is, which is uh, like you can say as Islamic uh, art, uh, yeah. which is related also to our uh, religion and our culture and region. But, uh, you know, uh, I do also other kind of work that is, uh, so maybe, I don't know if they call me Islamic artist. I don't think so. It's a, it's a thing that is linked to me. But I like to explore. I like to explore as yes. a documentary, you know, I like to explore things, whether it is Islamic, whether it is other religion, I don't mind. Like at the end of the day, something happened in my region, in my exactly. local country, exactly. I will do it. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, both of you are inspired by the Islamic legacy, by Islamic themes. So indeed, the word Islamic comes into it. Uh, it's a question of whether we call it modern Islamic practice or modern Islamic art. But what is really important is that both of you as contemporary artists have brought the notion of concept into your practice, mm -hmm. Islamic related practice, because one of the ways in which a sort of Islamic art was pushed back by the visual canon of contemporary art practice was the fact that there was always this idea uh, expressed that Islamic art, quote unquote, is lacking in concept, that it's only sort of focused on surface decoration and that it's an iconic and that, you know, it's limited to manuscripts and decorative arts and so on. Whereas in fact, what has happened through the exhibition of the Alberta Endowment and what was very clear at the, at the Abu Dhabi Art Fair when the exhibition first opened was that in fact, it is absolutely, the art that you produce is absolutely of the moment. It is very concept-based and whatever else, whatever other layers you add to it or inspirations that it comes from, the art itself is very much a valid part of today's contemporary canon. Um, I would love to know a little bit more about the projects, perhaps the art that you may be working on right now. Amr, is there anything special you want to tell us about in terms of what you're working on just now? Well, I've been uh, researching since the beginning of this year about, uh, I, I was, I'm always fascinated about performance art, which mm -hmm. is uh, something that I'm interested in, especially like, uh, since I did the Salah, which is not performance art, it's something else, it's, not, it's documentation of Salah. And then I did the Smalit, so I'm always this, you know, interested in performance, whether yeah. it is uh, related to religion or related. But uh, I'm trying to create things, but at the end of the day, it's just uh, research. Uh, and I'm trying to, you know, try to research about it. And as always, like, and I'm trying to learn uh, new, new technique, new things. Of course, it's always, at the, at, the, at the moment, it's more of photography and video, but I don't know how it will, whether, whether, whether I'll be doing actual performance, I don't know. I don't, until now, it's not clear mm -hmm. for me. But that's what I'm researching uh, since the beginning of this year until now, and I 
this is the work and I'm finding it uh, very interesting also and whatever yeah. I do for me it's interesting because it's yeah. something other than documentation or document yeah and do you have you know in your general vision what now of course we can't travel but I'm just wondering what travel would mean in terms of your research and the sort of lesser known aspects of Islam that you like to highlight I know up until now you've been very much uh, sort of looking at your own environment and often that's how a lot of things start um, but had did you have plans to uh, explore Islamic cultures in you know in other continents and so on and I wonder how the current situation with the pandemic and I'd love you both to talk about how you see your work within the pandemic I mean what what is going to be the effect of the pandemic for you yeah, for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, I think we will see like uh, work in in the next in the near future, which is called post-pandemic works, which yeah. is like, you know we, we saw post-modernism or post this. So uh, like as as I said, like I'm I'm all I'm trying to you know uh, trying to do things that is you know. Uh, first of all, it's uh, related to what I do, uh, but also learning new techniques. And uh, we are very lucky that we have internet, all the resources online now yes. available. And, yes. uh, and every day I find new websites and new uh, online libraries that, ha that give you access to lots of resources that you can research and you can, you know, learn about. And uh, of course, you know, to go and to, to, to visit the places is more, you know, uh, more uh, practical and more face-to-face -face interviews. But at the same time, you know, you need to be, you know, very flexible, you know, and try to uh, work with whatever, you know, resources I have. Yeah. Understood. Now, Amr, I've just had a, an audience request. Could you please um, take away the images of the works because they would like to see our faces? Is that possible? Okay. I'm so sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> now, same question to you, Fatima. I'd love to know how you feel about the effect of the pandemic um, on your work. Do you see it as a limitation? Or are you going to adapt to sort of more to online ways? What, what, what is the effect of the pandemic for you? Um, I've been kind of resistant to make work during this time. Uh, I don't want to be too reactionary maybe and wait it out. Mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. kind of my way of living and being. Uh, what I've been thinking about more is maybe initiatives where artists can still feel connected and maybe um, come up with ways to help each other. Um, that's quite important for me because obviously it's a, financially also it's a very difficult time for a lot of artists who are not uh, employed full time, for example. And the other thing I've been thinking about, because you know, our lives are dif now kind of mostly in the di digital realm. Yeah. Um, and a very important part of my practice is this idea of a fictive. Um, I do fictive uh, vocatives, you know, my website is kind of a fictive country. So I've also been thinking of a fictive university. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm toying with that idea um, be before, the virus you know put our lives on hold i was working on a, a kind of a reading group um supper club so i'm thinking yes. of which maybe of putting it online and developing it further mm -hmm. um so yeah I, I i'm focusing on things that will keep us connected whether it's friends or whether it's artists um because we're quite isolated and yeah yeah scared and you know we don't know what's happening what what the future will be yeah. like but it's i feel like it really helps to feel well, i suppose i suppose fatima it's a barzakh of its own isn't it we're in it this is. space this limbo absolutely. <laughs> absolutely i've been thinking about that so much actually since it started and yes. it was very relevant the theme yeah 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 we're in the between and we don't know in between so Amma, there is an audience question for you please um yes. the question is in terms of your work, what inspired you to create work using Mala? You, I mean, you touched on it, but do you see it as a new undiscovered art form? 
They mean malad as a art yes. form? Yes. Yes. You know that yes. I suppose. Uh, yeah. Malad and UAE, it's there on before that, every, like in the, in the Islamic region, it's in the Middle East, it's there since uh, I didn't discover something new. Like it was there since a long time. Mm-hmm. But maybe what I like, what what interested me as a, as a photographer and as an artist is to go and document it in a in a modern way and show it to people. I yes. mean, uh, in virtual re- reality, you know, uh, especially with the new generations, you know, in the exhibition, mm-hmm. you can't imagine how many like kids came and saw the modern in VR, you know, because it's yes. a VR device. Yes, something they want to touch, you know, people and now kids now they like to iPad, they like to use iPads and. VR and these things, and so, uh, so that's the way I think uh, you know I wanted to to, rec- to recreate it maybe or you can say or uh, to try to recreate my way of doing art mm-hmm. in this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, do you do either of you see any impediment in terms of Islamic law itself to be able to literally? Um, how can I say, take so much of Islamic expression online. Um, I suppose, you know, for example, the ability to see there was a time when it was considered haram, I suppose, to see, uh, pick, to photograph or show pictures of the Kaaba. And now, of course, we do see pictures of the Kaaba. But I'm just thinking in terms of practices such as the Maulid or perhaps other aspects of Islam, are there privacy issues? What, what do you see as being an impediment in terms of the digital world we live in and the laws of Islam? Do you see a contradiction, Amr? Yeah, I don't know. Like I, I also, like uh, 10 years ago when I used to go and, in the mosque and take pictures, they used to come to me and argue with me, what yes. are you doing, why are you do this? And, uh, but I think now it's more like uh, more understandable. And mm-hmm. I think it's more easier for people to understand you do this, and especially when you explain to them it's an uh, artistic, the idea, yeah. yeah, the idea behind it, and it's artistic, and you want to show this to the world. So, mm-hmm. and I think the social media like helped us, and also didn't help because helped us that people now can see everything online. And, but at the same time, people are now. Uh, they, they, don't, they are uh, like uh, they don't want them themselves to be shown everywhere. Also. Yes. So that's yes. also like yeah. that's also another part. Do you find, yeah. for example, that you have to ask permission when you're sort of showing, I don't know, a particular scene with certain people in it? What, will it? Will you? Are you going to need to get permission to copyright permission or permission from people to show them? Yeah, of course, like especially when you uh, try to document someone specifically in their houses and this. Yes. I think, uh, of course, it's always better to get permission and to, to have, the, you know, their uh, agreement to, for you to, to, do, to photograph it or video it. You know. Otherwise, you know, uh, you, know we, you know, you never know what it will happen after that. Indeed. And of course, in the pandemic world, because you're interested in performance, I'm just wondering, you know, how, how soon will it be possible to have performance again or maulid again or collectivity? I mean, I know I see on television and the press uh, about how with social distancing, uh, places of worship are reopening and prayers can carry on. But, you know, religion uh, very much is focused on collectivity, on congregation, on people being together. And it will be very interesting yeah. to see, you know, in terms of our Islamic expressions, what that means. Now, I have a, an audience question for Fatima. How did you perceive visitors' experiences to your installation, Fatima? Did you feel that your uh, concept was um, uh, thought-provoking to many people? I was actually pleasantly surprised um, at the amount of engagement I had in the space. Um, the variety of responses was quite wide. Um, there was someone who was, uh, really moved by the writing, for example, um, almost to tears. Uh, it made them really emotional. Then, wow. then there was a lot of surprise, but in a good way from young people, you know, um, 
who maybe know Barzakh in its escalo, uh, you know, a traditional sense, and then learning that, you know, and a lot of the more art students, obviously, they're, they're coming from universities and on tours mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So I could see a little sparkle in their eye, a twinkle that you can maybe take a concept like that and treat it gently and with respect and apply it to contemporary art. So I, I spent a lot of time in the space, uh, like I was saying, your participation and engagement, it's so important to me and uh, almost every work I make, I'm there participating or there is a way to participate or interact with the work. So um, it was great. Honestly, I enjoyed every day I spent there. Uh, and Amar, were you, were you surprised or sort of pleased with the audience reaction to your work? Yeah, especially, you know, the VR experience you, when you come to an art fair, you expect uh, to see work like an illustration or uh, like a painting or something. But to come and see a VR as an experience and as an art, it's something that people were uh, shocked to see. And I, and I, uh, I thought, I thought some people because I have experience with working with VR and uh, I did some other projects, and some pe some people didn't, uh, you know, uh, get, didn't uh, want to wear the VR because they feel dizzy or feel, you know. Yes. But uh, but but uh, but some people, you know, they, when they tried it, uh, they felt it's okay. Like, and especially yeah. as I said, with the with the younger generation, with kids, they really loved it, and they, yeah. and and they thought that themselves they are there, and especially yeah, exactly. in the VR, and the VR, there are some kids also sitting there, so it's like yeah. you know, <laughs> wonderful. Like now I have an audience question for both Amar and Fatima. What were your favorite works from the other endowment artists? Uh, Fatima, do you want to begin? Um, I'm going to say that it's Amar's, and I've told him this many <laughs> times <laughs> already. Uh -huh. um, I love that, you know, something so traditional and hidden yes. was brought to us in this way. So you have kind of a solitary experience. And I'm also not very tech, like I don't really love technology I think it was maybe the first time I put a VR on because I've always yes. been like too weird I'm you know I'm a tactile person I don't want to do that so uh, Amr's work is probably my favorite to be so, Amr, you, 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 have to <laughs> you don't have to return the favor <laughs> I won't be upset nice from Fatima because that's not going to work you have to give apart from Fatima okay yes <laughs> what other artist was your favorite in the exhibition well, uh, it's a very difficult question, actually. I, I always get something from the artwork that, you know, I see. Like uh, Tissam's work, I always follow Tissam's work and uh, I like her work and how it is very, like, mathematical. And uh, at the same time, you know, I feel that uh, there is, uh, and especially with this one, it was different than the work I usually see from Tissam. It's yeah. like 3D and the same time right. you see. Yeah. Another work is like... Uh, I always like the uh, work of also that, uh, I forgot his name, Hong Kong, from Hong Kong, the artist from Hong Kong. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah. Sand Liu. Yes, yeah, so that is also interesting. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> I don't have a specific... I mean, it, it was really a fascinating exhibition for me. And like you, I also was taken by Ebtissam Abdulaziz's work. I thought it's fascinating. Of course, I'm myself very... Um, taken by the concept of geometry and how geometry is used, not just in Islam, but how it's propagated in other uh, sort of visual canons in Western art and so on and so forth. But she had brought it to life in a different way, made yeah. it uh, three-dimensional. So it was a very interesting um, expression and, and for me also, as well. And also Dana's work, I, I really, yes. uh, I follow yes, Dana, Dana since a uh, yes. long time. Yeah, and uh, this one was different and uh, it has a deep meaning. So I think it was also one of my favorites also, this Indeed. exhibition. I should remind the audience, please do go to the Alborda website and take a look at the 360 degree virtual um, viewing of the exhibition, which, is, which has been launched and you can easily access and it will be interesting for you to see all the works. Um, it really was quite, uh, for me, an eye opener in terms of how uh, it can be, you know, the any form of Islamic inspiration or legacy can be interpreted in so many different diverse ways. Um, so I wanted to actually at this point uh, ask one last question in terms of, 
and I'm going to address this to Fatima first. Fatima, do you feel that in your work, you're always pushing boundaries? Do you feel that you are, you try to challenge yourself beyond your comfort zone? And if so, is that difficult to do it within the context of, um, how can I say, work that is inspired by Islam or not? I'm never comfortable, so I don't, I never think of putting myself out of comfort zone because I'm never comfortable, period. Right, interesting. Um, yeah. In terms of, no, I, I feel like I have a good sensitivity to um, maybe deal with uh, concepts that maybe, you know, they seem a little bit, not controversial, but sensitive, you know, like taking something that's, uh, this Islamic concept and uh, working with it and creating art, um, I feel a lot, a lot comes from your um, intuition. A lot comes from your intention, and mm -hmm. I feel like intention always it like seeps through your work. Yes. So I try to be very uh, aware while I'm working if my antennas are saying mm, that's too heavy-handed or that's too. Mm -hmm. I don't know, literal, that's, you know, you can do it a bit more subtle, you can think about more and develop it more. So I kind of follow my own um, kind of an inner compass in dealing with that. And if I'm really, really not sure, I'll put, I would talk to someone I trust. Um, yes. and maybe get so, so you don't deliberately, so you don't deliberately try, and try to push conventions and push the boundaries because certain artists, when you look at the work of certain Western contemporary artists, I'm always struck that there's sometimes a kind of almost deliberate or perverse desire to upturn something, to break a convention, to push a boundary. Uh, and I'm not I saying- I find it interesting to be, I don't find that very- Yeah, if it's just for the sake of that, it, it's, it's obviously less interesting than if there's something more profound to be expressed. Yeah. That's true, very true. How about you, Amar? Do you, I mean, obviously with Molid, you've chosen a subject, as you've said, that's a bit controversial. Do you try to find ways to push the boundaries or do you, do, does your work um, evolve in a different way? Yeah, I always try to find, you know, uh, a, a project that is maybe never thought about. Like even when I did my prayer room, uh, yeah. my prayer rooms, you know, at that time, uh, a lot of people, you know, were coming and also after the exhibition, they one of the people who used to who came to my exhibition he sent me like uh, photos of prayer rooms that he visited and tell me that you made us look differently in the, in the prayer room mm -hmm. uh, maybe my work is maybe it's a simple work but at the same time i try to bring that ordinary life to to attention of people mm -hmm. even uh, and also i try to uh, myself to challenge myself to use different uh, to use new medium yeah. to try to use, uh, to, to talk to new people that I never yeah. met, you know, which, which is for me, that is the interesting part of creating yeah. the work. It's, it's right. always interesting to meet new people and to try to, to challenge yourself, learn something new, uh, technology, mm -hmm. or also a new concept, uh, yeah. like what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. So that always, you know, a thing that I, I always try to find, I always try to do. Well, thank you so much. Fatima, I have to say, well, both of you, there is one last question. We're a little bit tight for time, but um, we can take one last audience question. This is addressed to Fatima. Can you please talk a little bit more about the in-betweenness in your work and the influence that takes in the physical elements uh, in the art? Um, oof, there's so much to say about the um, in-betweenness. Um, I think one you know, of the... I, I have to say, just to, I've got a quote here um, that, that I've, I found really interesting, Fatima. And I don't know, it's, you've expressed it from the Surah, surah Al-Rahman. Uh, um, he has made two seas to flow freely so that between them is a barrier that, that people cannot pass. Um, maybe that's, tell us about that. I mean, that's, you know, one of the mentions of Bar and the Holy Quran so I wanted to I wanted to have it there because you know if you read that piece of writing there is um, it would make sense because it has a lot to do with uh, dreams as well which play a really big world uh, big role in uh, Islam 
and also mm -hmm. you know our connection to the other world where we see maybe those who passed away or were giving us guidance and so on um in terms of in between this um i don't know if everyone was following the um, uh, the pictures Amars was showing, there are these uh, nebulous pieces that were shown, um, which is something you can interact with and they change shape because it's basically nylon filled with, uh, well, some of them nylon filled with rice. Mm -hmm. And I've been making them for quite a while and um, it's, the more kind of I work with them, they made me think more of like how as a, as also as, maybe it's also as a woman not just as a person how we change and how maybe uncomfortable it is and all these things that come with aging and graying and so on and how being comfortable with a passing of time where um, in the society in the world we live in we're not made comfortable to do that so there's kind of one part of that and then the fact that we're always in state of flux as a as, as people as well where we're, well, hopefully we're never always the same. So that space, I found, you know, that's another space of being in between. Right. And obviously, you know, living also in uh, UAE, it's, and a lot of people say it's a transient place, but, you know, I've lived here longer than I've lived back home. Um, but at the same time, a lot of people have come in out of my life because they lived here and they left. So I was looking yeah. at, um, you know, for me, Dubai as well is kind of a barzakh you know yeah. mm -hmm. being a transit place so there are so many so many um layers to it i can talk about it for probably two hours so whoever right. was yes. asking that question please feel free to message me on instagram or email me yeah to talk about it absolutely well we are running out of time and i would like to just take this opportunity to thank our two panelists our two artists whose work is really fascinating. And as I say, you can see the work on the Alverda website and thank again, the Ministry of Culture and Knowledge Development, the Alverda Foundation, and uh, to say goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.